Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Marlboro Senior Center. My name is Tammy Pazaricki, and I represent the Metro West Alzheimer's Partnership, who is sponsoring this event. Today, we welcome Dr. Paul Rea, um, who will be very unbelievable to listen to. He's a wealth of knowledge, and he's here to answer your questions. A little housekeeping. We have the schedule uh, for Dr. Rea to speak from 10 to 11. However, if you are engaged in questions and conversations with Dr. Rea, we certainly have the time to stay longer. Um, on your chair, there's a pen and three note cards. At any time, if you have a question for Dr. Rea, please write it down and we'll have a couple of the partnership members be collecting them and handing them to me. And then I will field the questions and Dr. Rea will answer those questions. Uh, restrooms, there's one right around the corridor down that hall, but if you go out this way, down the hall to the right, there's a couple of other restrooms as well. Help yourself to more coffee and breakfast. Um, and we'd like to get started. So let me introduce Dr. Rea. Paul Rea has worked in the fields of psychology and gerontology for 44 years. The past 28 years at the Alzheimer's Association, Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter as Vice President, Clinical Services. He is currently working as a consultant with several national Alzheimer's care providers and university programs, teaching and researching non-pharmacological approaches to address challenging behaviors in those with various forms of dementia. Dr. Rea developed a comprehensive approach to habilitative dementia care therapy. He has dedicated his career to teaching others how to connect with individuals with dementia emotionally, using the dom domains and techniques of habilitation therapy. He is deeply committed to the notion that many of the symptoms commonly associated with dementia can be treated and thoughtful behavioral can be treated with thoughtful behavioral and environmental strategies. Major hallmarks in his career are developing and facilitating the first support group in the country for early stage patients, consulting on the physical design of scores of dementia dedicated units in nursing homes and assisted living facilities and expanding the breadth and quality of services for those living with all forms of dementia and, and their families. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rea. You. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, they told me that um, we're gonna devote most of the time to your questions and uh, have this as a group discussion. But I wanted to start off um, with some comments because I think there's some change in our view of Alzheimer's disease that is important to get out to professionals and caregivers because our approach to the disease, I think, is going to need to change. In Massachusetts, uh, we don't have an exact number of people who have Alzheimer's disease, um, but it's estimated that it's around 120,000 people. And that is an estimate. Um, and one of my pet peeves is uh, that we really can't su support any of these numbers because so few people with Alzheimer's really get diagnosed and so few people who die w from Alzheimer's ever have that appearing on their death certificates. Um, so these numbers are estimates. And when I first started working in the f with Alzheimer's patients many, many years ago, um, there was a, a study going on in uh, uh, Charlestown, Massachusetts, and they literally tested everyone who agreed who was over the age of 65 and gave them a series of neuropsych tests 
to get an idea of how many, what percentage of the individuals tested over age 65 would qualify as having Alzheimer's disease. And that was done by Marilyn Albert, and she was one of my mentors. And that number is a clear estimate. It has very little scientific basis. And so all the, the subsequent uh, uh, estimates, uh, calculations were based on that original study. Since then, there have been more scientific studies, and the number has gotten a little bit more accurate, but I want to stress the fact that we don't really know how many people have Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a lot. Uh, we know that, but we don't have good numbers. The message I wanted to bring to you is that um, we don't have a cure for this disease in the near future. Recently, some of the drugs that were being tested and we, have, we had such high expectations for have failed. Um, there are other drugs in the pipeline that may also be helpful, uh, but it's going to be still several years before um, we know anything about them. My point being that where we don't have a cure on the horizon, we have to refocus the direction uh, of treatment to what we are doing in these, what you are doing in these partnerships. You are becoming more the therapeutic vehicle for this disease, the partnerships. And I was telling Bob Perone on the way here that my first obligation with the Alzheimer's Association was to start the partnerships in Massachusetts. Uh, and this was 29 years ago, or no, 30 years ago. And it's coming back now to the uh, concept that the partnerships are becoming a therapeutic model for what um, we can do for those with Alzheimer's disease. Let me go back to some of the numbers. Only 50% of those people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease ever are told they have Alzheimer's disease. And again, we're estimating that 50% of the people who actually have Alzheimer's disease never get diagnosed. Um, we're realizing from the failures of the drug studies that the earlier we intervene in the disease, the better patients will do. The disease starts in the brain probably 20 years prior to your seeing symptoms. So there's a lot of neuropathology of things changing in the brain uh, that is causing the brain to shrink, essentially. Um, and there's so much redundancy in the brain, you don't see symptoms until it gets to a critical tipping point. So the disease starts way before you actually see symptoms. The researchers are saying, well, if we're going to have an intervention, we've got to identify these people fairly early in, in the disease process for any kind of medication to work. So identification of those with the disease is extremely important. We're seeing certain states around the country that are having a very, very high incidence or percentage uh, of their population 
who have Alzheimer's disease. It's not because the number or, or the disease is increasing, but rather it's because the young people in any given state are leaving that state to find work elsewhere and leaving elders in the state. So the percentage of elders in a given state is increasing and therefore the number of people with Alzheimer's in those states are, are increasing. So you look at this phenomenon, Rhode Island, for example, has the highest percentage of elders dying from Alzheimer's disease. South Dakota, North Dakota have the next highest incidence. Um, if you look at the southern states, again, where there's a younger migration out of the south, leaving older populations, you see uh, a higher percentage of people uh, with Alzheimer's disease. What's happening is it's going to bankrupt those states. They're not going to be able to afford um, caring for these folks either in nursing homes or assisted living or even based in home care settings. So financially, we're going to have a huge problem in the not too distant future. What we are seeing is an incredible sense of inertia amongst families who are not identifying that the person is changing that there is something going on there. And so my point this morning is how, how can you help families or work within your own family to have an awareness that something is wrong and getting the resources that you need to address these issues earlier. The earlier we get to uh, uh, improving the situation for the person, the better the person with the disease will do and the better the caregiver will do. We need to recognize that this is a family disease. It's not just the person with the disease who's affected, the entire family, spouses, adult children, grandchildren, they're all affected by the disease. And all the research that I've seen and done on my own shows that there are long lasting effects on families. Um, just being a caregiver increases your chance of getting the disease. And why? Because in most cases, being a caregiver causes increased amount of stress. And stress is a risk factor for the disease. Depression is a risk factor for the disease. For years, I ran a support group for children who had grandparents living in their homes um, and who had Alzheimer's disease. Those children did not fare as well as similar age children who had grandparents living with them who did not have Alzheimer's. So they did not do as well in school. They had more um, absentees from school. Um, they had a higher incidence of depression. So just grandchildren have, are impacted by the disease. This is a family disease and we need to adopt new interventions that realize that this is a family disease. And we also have to understand as we look at states like North Carolina, uh, excuse me, North Dakota and South Dakota, that states can't afford to pay for nursing home care. And a lot of elders cannot afford for assisted living. 
so that the treatment has to be based on the community. And if there's inertia in the community in recognizing this disease, then we can't get the services, we can't design programs to help those people. What we know now is the most effective treatment for the disease is not Aricept, is not Dinopazil, but rather it is educating the family about how to anticipate problems and put things in place to avoid them, to teach them the techniques of communication, to teach them how the, the layout of the home is going to affect how the person with Alzheimer's will be able to interact in that home. Um, to understand the relative stages of how we offer personal care to the individual. I think what we're going to see is a shift from institutional-based care to home-based care, so that we're hiring home health aides, uh, homemakers to come into the home. We're going to put a, more reliance on adult day health programs, which I think are one of the best therapies for the disease, um, and rely more on the social networks within our communities and our, our um, uh, friendship um, networks as well. So let me just talk about a couple of things we can do to help families overcome the inertia of not recognizing the disease and not doing something about it. Most families, because this is a painful recognition, most families spend a lot of time just saying, oh, he's just getting older. That's the way people behave as they get older, they, get, they become forgetful. They can't do certain things. And they rely on the myth that it's just normal aging. What I would recommend is that we, you as the apostles here, uh, that are going out and working with families, and you who are family members who are here, understand that early recognition is going to be the best way we can avoid difficult behaviors, reliance on psychoactive medication. This is going to be the most effective treatment we have to date now. Early recognition, overcoming the inertia. So the first thing I would suggest is that if a family member sees something that concerns them about the person, that they hold a family meeting, not with the person who they're concerned about, and say at this family meeting, do you see what I'm seeing? This is an opportunity to get verification to get a buy-in from the rest of the family that something is wrong, or to at least exchange information that would say, well, I don't see that, but I'll be now on the lookout uh, to, to, to see if it occurs uh, and report back. So to have that family meeting to v validate what each is seeing in terms of changes in the person. The next meeting, if everyone agrees that there are changes, is to have a discussion with the primary care doctor. And it may be that the family uh, calls the doctor and is able to give them their viewpoint of what they are seeing. This is important because when the person who's under question, who we think has Alzheimer's, goes to the primary care doc, 
they're able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and appear that there's nothing wrong. And the doctor doesn't really have you know, a lot of information to work with. But I would recommend that the primary caregiver calls the doctor and say, this is what we are seeing. This is what our family is agreed upon that we all see. Or to write the doctor a letter. Or to set up an appointment with the doctor that you pay for um, without the person with the disease so that you can show, uh, give examples, and explain what the person is doing now that they didn't do before. This is very important. Once the person has been seen by the doctor and if a diagnosis is made, then the next conversation is going to be with the doctor to say, we need you to be the, the, the uh, uh, organizer of the team, the medical team that is going to uh, further evaluate our loved one and to continue to provide medical information and support for our family. So that the primary care doctor becomes the coordinator. What you want to probably do is have a referral made to a neuropsychologist um, who will administer a series of paper and pencil tests. Um, and if it's a good neuropsychologist, the result would be that you would get a report back saying these are the cognitive strengths of the person, these are the cognitive weaknesses. And you want to focus your attention on the strengths and avoid those areas that are weakened. Because as we put our, the emphasis on training and on um, experience with those skills the person still has, they will hold on to those skills for a longer period of time. You also want to have as part of your team um, a, a um, psychiatrist, a geriatric psychiatrist or a uh, geriatric neurologist um, who specializes in various forms of dementia. The, these individuals can be helpful with any medications that might be useful and advise the primary care doctor in um, um, looking at medical issues that can affect the disease. So for example, if someone has diabetes and is also a suspect for Alzheimer's, it's absolutely important that we control, um, get their numbers, the A1C number down to a, a normal rate, um, the hemoglobin A1C. The, if the person has high blood pressure, you want to make sure that they, might have, that they will have medications that will bring those numbers down to an accept, acceptable level. So you want the team to be treating all the other conditions that can influence the Alzheimer's disease. You want to see if the, it would be useful to have uh, scans of the brain uh, to see where the, uh, the, the brain is being affected to make sure we have an accurate diagnosis because there are so many other related disorders. And in 50% of the cases where, the, where there has been an autopsy, when we assumed it was just Alzheimer's, it actually was Alzheimer's and something else at the same time. So it was Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease of the brain at the same time. It was Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease at the same time. Um, and you can go on and on in that list. Um, so getting the medical team together and having the primary care doctor as the coordinator of that team, that tells you, that gives you verification in, within the family that yes, there is a disease process. And once we have that established, then the family can focus on what they need to do. 
The next conversation is with the friends of the person who has the disease. And you have to go to them and say, look, we know dad or John has a problem. But the most important thing right now is that you don't abandon him. And we can teach you how to work better with him. But you're going to be an important part of the therapy um, for his disease. Because we, if you look at all the research, when the friends leave the person with the disease, because they don't know how to react, because the person is acting in, a, in different ways, um, and they're uncomfortable with that, uh, then the person does much, much worse. What we know is the social contacts are one of the most important ways of keeping the person engaged in purposeful and meaningful activity. So within the family and within the uh, friendships and social contacts, it's important that they continue and that the family take responsibility to teach folks how best to deal with their loved one uh, at that particular stage in the disease. The next conversation, um, uh, well, let me go back, I forgot one. <laughs> there should have been a conversation after the person has been diagnosed um, with the person themselves, where you sit down and say, we are, as a family, we are in this together. This isn't just your disease. We are all going to be affected by this disease. And um, that you create a bond. Um, in, for many years, I, I, I taught Japanese psychologists about Alzheimer's disease. And they said something that um, made a lot of sense to me, um, <clears throat> that when a diagnosis is made, the family sits down with the person with the disease and talks about this bond that is corrected, that, it, that is created. What affects you affects me. We have this disease together. And they call that Kate Zinn. There's a, a Kate Zinn relationship between the person with the disease and the family. And that's acknowledged all the time. We are experiencing this. It's not just you. We all are. Uh, and we're going to work to support one another. Uh, and I think that's a valuable piece of information. But there are many more conversations you can have down the road um, within the family. But those are the essential ones. And the reason that I'm focusing on this is you go out and teach families the skills, how to set up their homes to maximize the person's independence. And that's going to change based on the uh, level of the disease. As you go out into the home and you teach families communication skills so that they first realize that you can't blame the person for things they're doing. You can't argue with the person. You can never use the word no. Um, you have to, at some point, enter the person's reality um, in your communications and not expect them to come back to you. Um, teach the family those very specific skills. Um, I'm reminded of the story of the uh, man and woman in bed together. Uh, he has Alzheimer's and he, he wakes up in the middle of the night and he shakes his wife and he says, I don't know who you are, but you better get out of here before my wife comes home. <laughs> so we would teach the wife to leave the bed perhaps to change what she was wearing, and come in and say, who was that lady I just saw leaving? <laughs> um, and then they don't remember the lady. Right. <laughs> um, 
but to teach families the art of how to speak Alzheimer's, as my colleague uh, Joan Koenig would say. How do you communicate with the person emotionally? And it takes some time to teach families. And as I said, I had a children's group, and we, we taught the kids how to not blame the person for what they are doing and how to enter into the person's world and how to um, connect with them emotionally. Little kids, and they, they could do it wonderfully well. We don't have a treatment in the foreseeable future from a pharmacological perspective. What we have are you as the advocates or you as the family members who can learn these skills and reduce the traumatic kinds of behaviors that we could see down the road, to reduce the need for medications that have, in some cases, terrible side effects. Uh, I just completed a study in 30 nursing homes in Massachusetts where we taught staff how to look for the triggers of behavior, of, of challenging behavior, and to put into place things that would prevent those triggers from happening, or once they occurred, to respond to them in a way that would minimize their effect. And what we were able to show was that we redu significantly reduced the need for psychoactive medication, particularly the antipsychotic medication that has a lot of side effects. We were able to reduce uh, resident to caregiver in, uh, altercations. Uh, we were able to reduce resident to resident altercations. We were able to reduce falls. We were able to reduce um, hospital visits and, and uh, repeat of hospital visits as well. And this was with just six months of training of the staff to better understand the triggers of the behaviors and to avoid those triggers. So as you go out and work with families or you as a family person learn these skills, that's treatment. That is treating the symptoms associated with the disease. And that's the change in our mentality that I think we have to adopt now. That the treatment is going to occur in the community. The treatment is in the hands of the families. And those of you who are geriatric care managers or professional folks in the field are going to be the apostles that are going to be preaching this change and overcoming family inertia and getting families to respond at an earlier stage. This is our best hope. And you are the vehicles to make this happen. It's not the professors at Harvard. It's not the physicians at MGH. Um, it's probably not even in the hands now of uh, uh, the, the nursing homes. It's more in the hands of the community providers um, who are uh, going to be the teachers, the mentors, the coaches of those families. And the recognition that when a disease is recognized, is a disease that affects the entire family. As I said before, the caregivers have a much higher chance of developing Alzheimer's disease later on because of the stress they have experienced um, and having other medical problems associated with many years of caregiving. Let me stop here and, and end with a story before we get to the uh, questions. 
um, with, an, again, another way of looking at this disease that I learned kind of late in my career. Um, I visited a family um, at the request of uh, an adult daughter. And um, the, the, the person with the disease was 93 years old. Her name was Celeste. And her husband was Peter, and he was 94. And Peter and Celeste lived next to each other when they were children. They married right after high school. Uh, they had grandchildren, they had children and many, many grandchildren and some great grandchildren. Celeste was in the late middle stage or the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. And the family asked me to meet with Peter um, to talk to him about um, giving up some responsibilities of care. Um, and I, I met with Peter and it, at his home, and he was about five foot two, and he used a cane and a crutch simultaneously. I never saw that before, really. Um, and one of the behaviors that the family wanted to take over was that Peter realized that Celeste took great joy in sitting in the kitchen watching the birds in the backyard through the window. And so seeing this, he then built four uh, bird feeders for the backyard. And he put them on long poles and he attached a ladder to each. And so every day, rain or shine, remember we live in where we have winter, uh, and Peter would hobble out in the backyard with his crutch and his cane, and he would ascend the ladder, and you can hear him kind of moaning with each step, and he had this bag of seeds around his neck, and he would uh, replenish the, uh, the feeders every single day. And the grandchildren and great-grandchildren said they would do it. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand, Dr. Rea. This Alzheimer's disease is a gift that Celeste has given me so that I can live my love for her. Wow. And if you take this away from me, it's taking away something that is so important to me as it is to her. Um, so I said, oh, OK. <laughs> um, the family took over other responsibilities and kind of watched him as he went up and down the ladder. Um, but that taught me something as well, that you can think of this disease not in, in you know, the, the uh, diminishing capacity of an individual, but rather as an opportunity to uh, be with the person in the moment with that disease, uh, to, to have a karmic bond with the person. Um, I recently read something that reminded me of um, what I'm, a, I'm thinking of, this new way of, of envisioning Alzheimer's disease. And it was a quote from St. Paul, a uh, letter, letter to the Corinthians, and he was saying to his disciples, um, or to the folks that he was, um, uh, that would be going out and spreading the word, he said, soften what has become rigid in the hearts of those with your message. And I think that's an appropriate thing to leave you with, that you are those who are gonna be softening what is rigid in the hearts of the caregivers to see that the therapy is going to take place in their home and you're going to teach them how to do it. 
Let me stop here. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Rea. What I'd like to do is, um, if you have questions, um, Seth is going to go around and he'll collect your note cards. If you need extra, we have extra. And we'll try to get to everyone's question and wrap up when we think all There are questions. no more questions. That's right. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the first question being, um, these are two actually, how accurate are the early diagnostic tests and are there blood tests in the works that can act as indicators for early Alzheimer's? Yes and yes. Um, the neuropsych tests, um, series of paper and pencil tests that can take a couple of hours, um, are, give us a lot of information. And we know that certain parts of the brain and therefore certain skill skills may be lost uh, fairly early in the disease or at mid-disease and so forth. So that neuropsych testing is, is very important and helpful to the family if the psychologist is able to say to the family, focus on this, don't focus on that. Here is what he can still do. There are imaging tests that are also very important that can help us better, un better see the disease. And now there are, are um, uh, new tests that, with new dyes that can light up parts of the brain that are affected by the disease. You know, we, we talk about amyloid being one of the byproducts of the disease, which is a um, buildup of uh, 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 plaques, but it, it is not enabling the cell to absorb nutrients because these plaques are there. Um, and we can light up the beta amyloid. We can light up another uh, protein called tau, which affects the dying of cells, brain cells. You can actually see that. You can look at shrinkage in the brain. Um, and you know that the brain will shrink in certain areas and not in other areas. Um, so that some of these imaging tests are important in terms of identifying the diagnosis and making sure we're not looking at another form of dementing illness or a combination of different dementing illnesses. Um, some of these other diseases carry some genetic inheritability, so these tests can be useful. Blood tests. There is indeed a, a blood test now that is not always available. Uh, it's mostly experimentally available, but um, a blood test that will um, measure tau um, in, in your blood. There's an, another, uh, and, and it, you can also, through a spinal tap, measure tau in your system. Uh, there is a, a blood test now for, for amyloid, um, but that blood test really only gives you um, a, a measure of amyloid fairly far into the disease. So it's not a very early diagnostic tool, um, but there is a blood test. And it's not readily available. You have to go to a, a major hospital um, that does a lot of experimental work. Can you tell us how stress affects the brain specifically? Stress, depression, um, anxiety uh, affect neurotransmitters in the brain. And these neurotransmitters um, are chemicals that enable um, cells to talk to one another, brain cells to talk to one another. And uh, with Alzheimer's and with 
um, depression and with certain mental illnesses, you see uh, that there's either more of these neurotransmitters than there should be, or in some cases, less of these neurotransmitters that should be there. And because these neurotransmitters enable brain cells to th either thrive or uh, re um, uh, uh, to repair themselves, uh, we see areas of the brain shrink, particularly above the ears in, in, in the temporal lobe, an area called the hippocampus, um, where uh, stress is processed, depression is processed, we see a shrinkage very early uh, in the disease and we, that affects the person's ability to remember, uh, to um, uh, uh, categorize information, um, and it's one of the earlier signs of Alzheimer's. So stress definitely has a, an impact because of the chemicals, the neurotransmitters, uh, dopamine, serotonin, um, uh, norepinephrine, and so forth that are in that part of the brain. If Alzheimer's causes changes in the brain up to 20 years prior to symptoms, how does mild cognitive impairment relate to Alzheimer's? Does this represent a type of dementia? Mild, well, when I first started, we thought that mild cognitive impairment was a disease unto itself. Um, and it, it, in fact, could be. But now I think there's a better understanding that mild, what, we're, what we call mild cognitive impairment is just early Alzheimer's disease. It's, it's in 20% of the times when people are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, it doesn't progress further. But that can be an anomaly. In most of the cases with mild cognitive impairment, it progresses into Alzheimer's disease or what we would recognize as Alzheimer's. It is. Mild cognitive impairment probably is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease makes the families feel very powerless. Can you suggest ways to help families overcome these feelings? Well, that was the point of my talk. <laughs> 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 that, that you have a lot of control. That if we teach families the skills um, we can help them gain control of the symptoms associated with the disease. Um, they are the practitioners of the, probably the best therapeutic um, intervention we have. Um, you know, if, if you look at the medications that are available now, um, you know, they actually don't improve function at all. Um, they, they might slow decline, but they don't improve function. Um, and that's in the best of circumstances, slowing decline. But none of the, none of the um, medications we give folks early on in the disease have been shown to actually improve their function. You led into the, the um, medication that's out there, and this question relates to how, uh, is there a drug you would recommend for someone in the moderate stages of Alzheimer's? Nemenda is a drug that is often used for middle stage disease. Um, my personal observation is that it helps some people um, for short periods of time, but in several cases, it may actually 
um, cause other symptoms that are problematic, um, such as anxiety. So uh, Nemenda, mid-stage disease, may work, may not work, does have side, uh, significant side effects that you have to be mindful of. This is a great question. When someone goes to a memory care assisted living facility, how often should family visit? It sounds like sister is arranging almost 24-7 schedule. Shouldn't they let the resident acclimate? Controversial area. Um, I would, my, when I first started, I would say I agreed with that. But every case is different. And there may be situations where someone's admitted to a unit and there needs to be sort of that comforting family agent. It might not necessarily be a visit, but frequent telephone calls. It might be um, a, a videotape that you make um, that you just chat with the person. Or it may be that you actually visit. The old rule of thumb was you didn't visit early on so that the uh, person with dementia would bond with the staff and it would help the, per the person with dementia feel as if this is their home. In some cases, there's so much anxiety that it would be almost inhumane not to deal with it um, by having the family help in the transition. So it's, it's, I judge this by a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not automatically going to say, you don't visit for the first two weeks. Did you in, in, some time, in some cases, it's the family that has the extreme anxiety and create more of an issue on admission. Than right. it is the, I'm, the, I'm the, glad the, you brought that up. <laughs> when you admit a family, a resident, you admit a family. Mm -hmm. So I would strongly support that at the time of admission, you have a course for the family and teaching them how to visit so that they're going in with a plan of what they want to accomplish in that visit and that plan is to help mother or dad do better emotionally the visit isn't for necessarily for the for the for you the the daughter but it's to help the person with the disease um, so that I, I will have families, for example, have a visiting bag of things that they can do with the person while they're there um, and not come in. How many times do you hear this? Someone visits their loved one and, and they say, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> and, the, you know, and the person says, I, I, don't, I don't know. And that makes them feel terrible. Instead, teaching them to come in and say, I heard you had meatloaf for lunch, it's your favorite, and you loved it. So you're telling the person what they did, and you're reinforcing an emotion. But we have to teach families how to visit before we allow them to visit. And it should be mandatory as part of the admissions process that we have these courses for families because they're part of the therapeutic team. If a parent has Alzheimer's, does a child have a greater risk of developing the disease? Yes and no. <laughs> um, there is a, there is a gen genetic um, risk factor associated with the disease, but what we're learning is that it isn't a fait accompli. There are 22 genes associated with Alzheimer's. Of those 22 genes, they, they carry less risk, more or less risk factors. So you could have one gene that has 1% risk factor. You can have another gene that has a 70% risk factor associated with it. 
So if you have that 70% one, you have a higher um, uh, chance of getting the disease. Uh, if you have two or three of the other risk factors, um, you have less of a risk factor, but still it's an accumulating risk factor. There's a, probably one of the most exciting areas of research now is that there's uh, uh, families in Colombia, uh, South America, um, who carry this APOE4 gene. So that it's the high risk familial disease that you usually get uh, a bit younger um, uh, than as is typical. And they're following these th families, and there are a number of identical twins within this population. And they're following these families, and the idea is that if we give them the medications that have failed in United States testing, because we gave them to folks too late in the disease, before the, you know, when all the damage is already done, um, and uh, rather than give it, giving them the medication before the disease starts. So they're looking at these identical twins that have a very high risk of the disease, and if they're giving the medication to one twin and not the other, and they're looking at whether or not they're able to prevent the disease. This is uh, an important area of research, I think. But it's all based on the notion of beta amyloid being the bad guy. And a lot of us in the field now think that that's not the case. Beta amyloid is a consequence of something that's happening earlier on, such as inflammation, that there's some kind of uh, inflammation going on in the brain that is causing the amyloid to form. Another one is you've heard of uh, Alzheimer's being uh, type 3 diabetes. Um, and it's just you, a di form of diabetes that you, is unique to the brain. When the brain can't get glucose, which is its ma major food source, um, in, the brain cells will die or become inflamed and eventually die. Um, so the brain is becoming insulin resistant. Um, uh, insulin allows the glucose to go into the, into the brain cell. So as more insulin builds up outside the brain, cells die, um, and that's the cause of the disease. There's some exciting work now being done at the Brigham where they have a nasal spray uh, that's insulin and gets up into the, past the blood-brain barrier. And it looks like it's working on mouse models. Um, so th that's an exciting prospect. These two questions, um, they're talking on the topic you're talking now, and um, the they're wondering, if someone has a mini stroke at a younger age, will that bring on the disease? That's the first question I'll let you answer. Possibly, yes. Um, in about 40% of the cases of folks with Alzheimer's disease, they also have um, vascular disease of the brain. And it, that vascular disease can be in two forms. Um, one is where they have large vessel disease, and the other is where they have small vessel disease. And there seems to be sort of a precursor to, in some cases, developing Alzheimer's with s small TIAs, tr uh, transitory attacks, um, that can cause what we think is Alzheimer's disease. So the, there is, seems to be a relationship. If that many, if 44% if of the people who had an autopsy, um, we see 
have Alzheimer's disease and also have a vascular disease of the brain, then there, has, then there must be a relationship. That leads to this next question, which is asking, um, does Alzheimer's and vascular disease, are they different symptoms that present? And, and if so, what would they be? They are very different from a symptom perspective. Alzheimer's, pure Alzheimer's, is a steady decline of capacity over time. Vascular disease of the brain uh, is a stepwise fashion. So the person's at a plateau for a period of time, and then all of a sudden, they're not able to do what they did before, and there's a precipitous decline. And then the person levels out for a period of time, and then there's, again, a sudden decline. And so it has this stepwise fashion in the rate of decline. Most often with vascular disease, we see language problems. We see problems with um, uh, uh, repetition uh, very early on in, in the disease. Uh, we may see visual problems with vascular disease that we don't see with Alzheimer's. Um, we may see hallucinations and delusions earlier than we would see with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, we have a last question, unless you folks have more questions to please pass along to Seth. Um, do you know of a community that has actively tried to reach out and implement your strategies? Yeah, there are a number of uh, nursing homes and assisted living programs who have undergone training and habilitation therapy um, and who practice that on a regular basis. And certainly that would be something that I, as you're looking at places and considering them, um, you know, they've gone to the Alzheimer's Association, they've been trained in habilitation therapy, um, and um, they most likely would have special care units uh, for dementia. Um, it's an important question to ask, I think. But habilitation therapy is not the only good training model. There are a number of other training models that are out there. Um, but what you want to focus on is um, sitting down, going, going into a facility, if it's a nursing home or assisted living, and taking the tour, and taking the tour that, where you're going to be shown and told all, all about the good things that are there. But then go back and ask if you can just sit for a number of hours and watch and watch the interactions with the staff and the residents. Watch the interactions with, amongst the residents themselves. Um, look at whether or not the environment is, is calm and predictable. Um, that's important. Talk to other family members and say, may I contact you um, outside of the facility to hear your thoughts on the quality of care here. Um, so it's not just the training, but it's the whole atmosphere and the application of the training and the consistency of the training um, that's important. But ask them if they've had uh, habilitation therapy as a training form. Um, it, the, the technique now has gone across the country, so it's, it's, it's not just in Massachusetts. This question is, what tips do you have to get my mom to accept help? Sometimes she agrees, forgets she agrees, and will adamantly say she doesn't need it. She belittles herself by saying, what, do you think I'm stupid and incapable? 
I've tried to say that she has lots to do to take care of the house, the pets, the yard, and dad, and that it's okay to relax a bit and get some help. This is typical, right? Right, right. And I, I think you have to start slowly and have a family intervention, if possible, and say, um, as, as I said earlier, that if you look at the statistics, um, that caregivers, because this disease can go for many, many years, caregivers themselves uh, develop a higher risk factor for the disease simply because they were caregivers. And so to minimize that, um, you know, let's bring in some help. But it's got to be where the, 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 the primary caregiver is giving approval of that help. So you may bring in a person and she decides, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get a housekeeper. But she needs to approve and feel that she has the final say in which housekeeper. You've agreed housekeeping is needed, but she can, um, uh, in, in any way, reject a, a particular candidate um, or accept a particular candidate. So she feels like she has some control in the situation. Um, this is a, is a difficult question to, to get the person to recognize that they need help. And another way of looking at this is to say, this isn't for you. This is for dad. Because if you have enough time away, you're going to be, have a better temperament and be better able to deal with dad. So this isn't just for you. It's helping dad as well. Um, and I would introduce it very slowly so that you, you say, okay, maybe it's once a week. And then as you, the woman is able to build a relationship with the caregiver that you've hired, uh, you can increase the number of hours. But there has to be a trusting relationship between the person coming into the home and the, and the primary care provider. Other questions? There's one more. We're going to do one more question and then we'd like to um, close on that and certainly we'd ask that you visit the Alzheimer's Association table um, to go on that topic of family support. What I can recommend is um, the helpline, the 24-hour helpline because they're going to lead the families to the support groups out there, to the, to the things that will help them, the counseling, the care consultation. Um, Julie McMurray, the regional director from our Central Mass office, is here. Um, and if something pops in your head and Dr. Ray is still here after our closing, uh, we welcome you to stay. And also, there is an evaluation for this program if you could fill that out before you leave. So our one last question is about trials, research trials. Who do you recommend uh, research trials to for Alzheimer's? Go to the Alzheimer's Association, and there's a, a program called Trial Match, um, which you can access online or you can work through someone at the association to, to help you access that. And what you will see is what um, programs are available. And it's not just drugs that they're looking at. They're looking at all kinds of issues where they need uh, volunteer um, subjects. And you will enter your information and it will tell you which of these experimental programs you would qualify for or your loved one would qualify for. So there's a lot of help out there through the association, uh, particularly around you know, learning the skills of, uh, of being a caregiver and, be, and being supported in providing those skills by the association, but also through the 
the trials, the experimental trials that are out there. They're not all drug trials. Um, and you have to be aware that um, you have to be fairly healthy to qualify for a drug trial. You have to be fairly early in the course of the disease. They all have different uh, criteria, um, but not everyone is uh, admitted into a drug trial. Well, I'd like to, on behalf of the Metro West Alzheimer's Partnership, um, thank you immensely for your time and for being here. And also, we'd like to pre present you with um, a check for $1,000 for the I'm Still Here um, Foundation. And wow. I'd like you to tell the audience a little bit about what that <laughs> foundation is. <laughs> it's big bucks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I am on the board of directors for the I'm, uh, I'm Still Here Foundation. And this foundation uh, has been primarily involved in uh, exposing folks living with the disease and their families to various forms of art um, and in very special ways where it, you might go to the museum but it's a, uh, a docent who has been specifically trained in working with folks with Alzheimer's who is presenting information. And it's the, the rest of the museum may be closed at that time. Uh, or you may go to a a, a movie theater and watch old movies where you, it's stopped at some point and it's discussed amongst within the audience. Um, exposure to art has been the primary focus, but now we as a board are thinking of issues related more with social justice and those with Alzheimer's. So how can you qualify for services uh, that are very needed? And how can we get more services, uh, both at the state level and the federal level? Um, what areas in, are, when someone is in early stages of Alzheimer's disease and they're still working, how is that evaluated in terms of what aspects of your job can you still do? And what aspects of your job you can't do? And from a social justice perspective, working with firms uh, and employers to help the person transition out of their position over time by giving them um, work that they still can accomplish. There were many things that we're, we're looking at in terms of social justice issues. But thank you very much. That's going to be. Great. If you have any other questions, I'll be over here and please feel free to come up.